Okay, thank you for the introduction. And thank you for the invitation to give this talk. Um, you amassed a very impressive list of speakers at this talk covering a lot of topics. Um, so the title of the, the, um, the conference was on testing aspects of general relativity. I'm not so much gonna be talking about that. I'm gonna be talking about a particular method of modeling binaries, the gravitational self-force and multi-scale expansion method. And I've given it a bit of a grandiose title, a new framework for binary modeling. So, you know, people familiar with self-force will not think of it as so much a new framework. Um, but really I wanna stress the point that it is quite a lot of new stuff relative to what's currently done in um, LIGO Virgo CAGRA modeling and you know, kind of represents a paradigm shift in how to model binary, binaries going forward to the next generation. So first let's just think about the, the gravitational two-body problem and its two most important axes. So this is kind of a classic picture that many, many people include in their slides. Um, this is the orbital separation between the two bodies and the mass ratio of the two bodies. This is written as large mass over small mass. So it goes from one to infinity. Um, throughout most of the talk, I will instead consider small mass over large mass. Now in different regions of the parameter space, we use different models. And historically for, for LIGO type modeling, the emphasis has really been on this left-hand side. So the kinds of things we see with LIGO, you know, are very typically quasi-circular and almost equal mass, definitely in the comparable mass regime. And so the kind of simple binaries over here. And when the two bodies are widely separated, you can use post-Newtonian theory very effectively. When the two bodies get very close together, then you resort to numerical relativity. Um, but, and then in terms of the overall paradigm that's currently used for, for modeling binaries, you then tie those two things together using effective one body theory um, or using phenomenological models. But even phenomenological models these days are using information from effective one body theory. So, you know, you build some fast model that ties together post-Newtonian theory and numerical relativity to give you a binary that evolves from here down to here. But even with LIGO Virgo Cagra, we're already starting to see mass ratios more on the right-hand side of this diagram. So they have detected a mass ratio of one to 26, as far as numerical relativity is concerned, is pretty extreme. And you know, it's already outside the regime where the fast models have been calibrated, where you know, we can really trust them to be validated. And of course, next generation detectors are gonna see a much wider variety of binaries with much, much greater precision. So next generation ground-based detectors are gonna see higher precision. They're gonna see higher mass ratios. And really once we go to LISA or space-based detectors, we're gonna see a huge range of mass ratios. And so we're gonna be really needing to consider more of this whole parameter space. And in particular, this, side down here, where it's small separation, so you're highly relativistic, but you're at an extreme mass ratio where one of the bodies is much, much smaller than the other one. And this is where we use self-force theory and we use the kind of modeling that I'm gonna be discussing. Okay, so the most extreme example of this is has got extreme right in the name. It's extreme mass ratio in spirals or EMRIs for short. So this is where you have a supermassive black hole in a galactic nucleus. So say, you know, 10 to the five up to 10 to the seven uh, solar masses. And it's being orbited by a stellar mass black hole or neutron star, this little guy here with a small mass. And these systems are very interesting because the entire time that we are observing this binary, so the entire time that's in the LISA band, is in the strong field regime. So within 10 Schwarzschild radii, or actually usually significantly less than that. So very, very close, highly relativistic. Uh, 
and it spends a long time in that highly relativistic regime, you basically get an inverse of the small mass ratio number of orbits. So basically 10 to the five, if you have a 10 to the five mass ratio. So we get a huge number of orbits and they're very complicated. And so we get a very detailed map of the geometry around the big black hole. So basically the small guy is acting as a probe of the strong field regime around the black hole. So that's the most extreme example of a small mass ratio system. And historically, that's really been what's motivated the development of uh, what I'll call gravitational self-force theory. But what I want to emphasize in this talk is that self-force theory is not just a method of modeling emeries. It's a very general method. Um, and as I'll show later on, there's no reason to restrict it to the emery regime. So the general method here is we consider some space-time containing a small body, where by small, I mean that its, its mass is small compared to the external length scale of the system. So for a, a, a emery, the external length scale would be the big mass of the big black hole. And the idea is roughly we consider a series expansion in powers of the small mass divided by whatever the external length scale is. So the exact metric looks roughly like a power series like this. As I'll show later, it's more complicated than just a simple power series. Um, the zeroth order term is the external spacetime. So for an emery, that external spacetime would be the spacetime of the big black hole. And then we have perturbations due to the small body. Then this deformation of the geometry due to these perturbations is going to react back on the small body itself and affect the motion of the small body. And so we say it exerts a self force, where if we write the covariant acceleration of the body in the background space time, it's not zero like we would have for a geodesic. Instead, we have corrections to the geodesic motion coming from these perturbations, H1, H2, and so forth. And also finite size effects come in also in these forces as well. Okay, now before I get to the, the really new exciting stuff, um, I wanna give just an overview of what I mean by self-force theory. So more detail about what I just presented in that last slide. And I'll break it up into what I call the local problem and the global problem, both of which are interesting. So starting with the local problem. So what I mean by the local problem is really, how do I add a small body into a space-time? How do I add it into the Einstein field equations? And the key method here is the method of matched asymptotic expansions. So here I'm showing the example of a binary, but again, this doesn't have to be a binary. This is a general method. But the idea is we zoom in near the small body, and there we can identify different regions. And in each region, we use a different approximation method. So in the external universe, where we're at distances from the small body that are comparable to the external length scale, in this case, the large mass, out there, we treat um, the small guy as a source of perturbation on top of the external universe, like I showed in the previous slide. But then once you get sufficiently close, um, that breaks down because sufficiently close, the small body is actually the main source of, of gravity. So it is dominating the gravitational field locally. And so then we construct a different expansion um, that basically takes the space-time of the small guy as the background and looks at corrections to that. And then in this buffer region, we have a matching method where we can take information from the inner region and translate it out into information in the external universe. Now, really all the action takes place in that buffer region. And the idea is we solve the field equations, we solve the Einstein equation in the buffer region, and we find this nice clean split of the full metric into two different pieces. So here, this is the body moving through space time with time running kind of you know, diagonally upward here. Oops, back up. So this is the full metric. This is for a material body, so there's no singularity. Uh, if it were a black hole, you know, you'd have a singularity somewhere inside. And we break that up into two pieces. 
a self field, which is basically the kind of the equivalent of a Coulomb field. It's the, the bound field that the body is carrying along with it. And then this effective metric, which is the external metric plus a particular piece um, of the field that's due to the small body. And so while this one is, you know, changing kind of rapidly on the scale of the small body, this effective metric is changing slowly on the external length scale. So there's kind of an effective field theory uh, idea here, although we're not using effective field theory methods. And the self field is directly determined by the object's multipole moments. So it's, its mass, its spin, its quadrupole moment, its octopole moment, etc. Whereas this external metric, this effective external metric, which I'll call G tilde, is a smooth vacuum metric. So it's vacuum everywhere, including you know, where the body would be. And it's not determined by local information like the, the object's multipole moments. Instead, it's determined by global boundary conditions. So solving the Einstein equations in the buffer region also gives you more than that, it gives you an equation of motion telling you how the center of mass of the small object is moving. So through second order and perturbation theory, we can write that equation in a very simple form like this. So this is the geodesic equation in that external, that effective external metric. Uh, this is for a non-spinning body. For a spinning body, you would have spin effects right here. And if you had a quadrupole on your body, you'd have quadrupole effects here as well. But for a non-spinning body, you have geodesic motion in this effective external space-time. And I want to stress that this is derived directly from the Einstein equations outside of your small body. Um, I'm not doing any kind of regularization method. There's no infinities. There's no assumptions about what HR is. All I'm doing is, is solving the Einstein equation and this is what pops out, this equation of motion. Okay, but it is convenient to then, after doing that, introduce a singularity into the system. And why is that convenient? Well, the same reason it's convenient to use a point particle rather than an extended mass, um, because we don't care about the fine, you know, intricate little details inside the body. We want to reduce, we want to eliminate those little details and deal with um, more you know, big scale physics. So the idea is we just get rid of this region where the body is, and we just take our solution for the self field in the buffer region, and we just analytically extend it down to some representative world line where it, is, where it becomes singular. So think of that like a, like a Coulomb field, you know, it's one over distance if you have an extended charge, the Coulomb field is one over distance if you're outside of the charge, and you can just extend that down to distance equals zero, and you get a singular field um, kind of at the effective center of, of the charge distribution. Same idea here. Could I so ask we're doing this. A clarifying question about uh, HR. Yep. At this stage, so uh, both HR and HS are uh, sourced by the small body, right? No. So the combination HS plus HR are sourced by the small body. You then split it up in such a way that HR is a vacuum solution. So this total metric here is a vacuum metric. Okay. okay. So, so, okay. So, but uh, if you send the sub, uh, mass of the small body to zero, HR will go to zero. Yes. Yes. Um, so it's basically the nonlinear effect that is generating it. Um, there are nonlinear effects included, but it's it'll also be there at linear order. Okay. So, um, like if you go to a very simple linear problem like um, electromagnetism, then say electromagnetism in flat space, then in that particular limit, um, h the equivalent of h r is the half retarded minus half advanced solution. Oh, okay, okay. I see. I understood. Okay, fine. Thank so you. It's, so it's, um, yeah, it's kind of a yeah. non-causal solution. Yeah, okay, I understand. Okay. It's a, it's a one that is uh, that is related to the object, but which is smooth at the world line. 
Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 So that um, that doesn't uniquely determine it, but there's some other conditions that you use to specify it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, the idea is when I do this extension, um, I'm not changing the self field in the buffer region or further out, and I'm not changing the effective metric at all. So I'm not changing the physics in the external universe. I'm just changing, you know, the physics right near this little region here by getting rid of the body and replacing it with a singularity. Now, through second order in perturbation theory, this thing I've just done is in fact equivalent to just replacing the object with a point mass. Um, but the idea here is that this is actually being derived it's not an assumption that we're putting in a point mass. We're not putting in a, a singular point mass and then trying to regularize. We're dealing with finite quantities and then showing that the field outside out here is in a particular mathematically delicate way, identical to what you'd get if you just put a point mass on a world line in here. So at linear order, that isn't actually delicate at all. At nonlinear orders, it becomes very delicate. You need a very specific um, kind of definition of this nonlinear piece. So I'm defining the stress energy as basically just the total curvature. We have a linear piece in H1, a linear piece in H2, and then a quadratic piece in H1. And yeah, there's some mathematical subtleties in defining this as a distribution so that this thing is well-defined. But if you do that the right way, what pops out is the stress energy of a point mass, but it is the point mass in the effective metric. So this is the four velocity as normalized in the effective metric. This is the effective metric here. This is proper time in the effective metric. So we have this nice picture of a stress energy of a point mass in the effective metric, and it's moving on a geodesic in that effective metric. Okay, so that's all kind of the the basics of how we build up the foundations of our model. Now let me go to the global problem. So the global problem is, okay, I've got um, a small body in my Einstein equations. I know how to deal with it now. Um, I'm skipping over a lot of, a lot more details of how to do that, but take it as given, we've got that, we've got an equation of motion. And now the question is, okay, let's take a particular external background. Let's take it to be the Kerr metric of the big black hole. How do we now solve the field equations globally in that background? So to build up how I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna start at zeroth order. So at zeroth order, we just have geodesic motion in the external background. So we have a test mass on a geodesic in the Kerr geometry of the big black hole. Now, geodesic motion in Kerr is already complicated. This is kind of a generic orbit. It looks very, very complicated, um, but it is integrable. It has three constants of motion, the energy, the azimuthal angular momentum. So that's angular momentum around the, um, the axis of the spin of the big black hole. And this thing called the Carter constant, which is related to orbital inclination, basically how high up this thing will get and how low down it'll get. So this integrable motion um, has three different types of oscillations. So one is it's just going round and round azimuthally in the phi direction. Um, it also is going in and out radially, and it's going up and down in the polar direction. So for each of those three uh, pieces of the motion, we can assign a phase that runs from zero to two pi along one complete oscillation. So one trip around as muesli, we get a phase that goes from zero to two pi, one oscillation in and out, zero to two pi, and up and down, zero to two pi. So we have three phases like that, and we can construct them um, so that they have constant frequencies with respect to say boyer lindquist time. So these are um, action angle variables, if you're familiar with that. Specifically, it'll be important to associate it with the boyer lindquist coordinate time. Okay, so that's just geodesic motion. Now, 
once you include the self force, well, you don't have any constants of motion. These three variables are slowly evolving. They're going to be changing because of the dissipative effect of, of the self force. But they are slowly evolving. So we get two distinct time scales. We have the radiation reaction time, which is inversely proportional to my small mass ratio. That's the time over which these guys evolve. Then there's the orbital time, which is basically one over the one over um, one of these frequencies. So that's independent of the mass, mass ratio. Now about 10, no, more like 15 years ago now, um, Hinder and Flanagan used this separation of time scales to initiate a, a very important program um, of doing multi-scale expansions of the binary problem in the small mass ratio limit. And what they showed was that on this radiation reaction time, on this long time scale, those three orbital phases I mentioned have an expansion like this. So there's a leading term that's one over the small mass ratio. And that's because these guys are accumulating roughly linearly in time. So if you wait a time one over epsilon, you get a phase one over epsilon with some coefficient. And this coefficient is evolving on a slow time epsilon multiplied by t. So epsilon multiplied by t is of order one if t is of order one over epsilon. So this is a slow change. Then there's a correction and higher and higher orders. And the thinking for modeling Emery's in particular, maybe not for other binaries that I'll get back to later, but for modeling Emery's, the thinking is, okay, well, this thing over here goes to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So if we have a mass ratio, you know, 10 to the minus five, this is gonna be negligible, which means that if we have these two things, correctly in our model, we should have a very precise um, model of the orbital phases. And as I'll show in a second, those then give you a very precise model of the waveform phase. So the thinking is, these are what we need to get a good model of Emery's. They're necessary and sufficient. And they Hinder and Flanagan define some nomenclature. They call this leading order term the adiabatic order. They, they inherited that from previous, um, previous methods. And it's determined entirely by the averaged dissipative piece of the first order self force. So you don't need the full first order self force, you need a specific piece of it, the averaged dissipative piece. Then this next term they called first post adiabatic order. And they showed that this is determined by the averaged dissipative piece of the second order self force. So a piece that comes from H2, the second order metric perturbation, but just a specific piece of it. And it depends on the entire rest of the first order self force. So the conservative piece of the first order self force and the uh, oscillations within the first order self force. So for the last 15 years or so, this has been the goal of the self force community to calculate these two things, which requires all of H1, all of F1, and a bit, an important bit of H2 and F2. Okay, so to describe how we're gonna do that, um, first, let me talk about what was done, has been done historically, you know, up to and including today, for calculations at first order, so ignoring second order. The thinking historically was, okay, well, on short time scales, the motion of the small body is can be approximated as a geodesic of the big body. So you just put the particle on a geodesic, you let it go around forever, it's just orbiting round and round and round. You then impose outgoing wave boundary conditions at infinity and at the horizon. So by that, I mean that waves are only going into the horizon and only going out at infinity. And you just solve for the first order metric perturbation for that particle source. You calculate the, um, the regular field in order to get the first order self force. 
And then you think, okay, well, now let's use that to do something. So it was always fairly obvious that this kind of approach is not going to work forever. It's not going to work for all time. It's not going to give you an actual in spiral because it's only on short time scales where you can approximate the orbit of the small guy as a geodesic of, of the large guy's space time. And so in particular, uh, that approximation breaks down on this time scale called the dephasing time, which is one over square root of epsilon. So on that time, the distance between the true orbit and the geodesic that you're using um, becomes large. So then the idea is to somehow, or one idea was then to somehow kind of stitch together a sequence of approximations like this in order to capture the whole evolution. Now that kind of stitching idea is misleading and it's not what we're gonna do. Instead, we're gonna do this. So this is what we're still calling a multi-scale expansion. I don't know if we still stood, should still be calling it a multi-scale expansion, but it's a multi-scale expansion of um, the Einstein equation, the metric perturbation, the orbit of everything all together. Um, so this is a formalism I've developed over the last little while um, with students and collaborators. And the key idea here is that the time dependence of the metric, you can reduce to the time dependence of mechanical variables. So that, by that, I mean um, the variables that are characterizing the, the orbit of the particle, but also the variables characterizing the big black hole. So the mass and the spin of the big black hole. We then want to find a nice set of um, mechanical variables that give us a nice Einstein equation. So what we use is a version of perturbed action angles. And we can set these up in such a way using a, a series of basically coordinate transformations on the phase space of these mechanical variables. We can find nice variables to have a nice equation of motion like this, where these three phases still have frequencies. They still have the geodesic frequencies, exactly like before. But by that, I mean their geodesic frequencies as functions of slowly evolving um, system parameters. And the system parameters are say, as an example, versions, kind of deformed versions of the energy, angular momentum, Carter constant, and mass and spin of the big black hole. So all of those guys are slowly evolving, and we can write evolution equations for them like this. So we have, when I say they're slowly evolving, you, you can see why that's true, because the rate of change is proportional to epsilon. And this f tilde zero a, um, is constructed from a certain piece of H1. Uh, this F tilde A1 is constructed from more of H1 as well as from parts of H2. Or equivalently, this is from a piece of F1, the self-force F1, and this is from a piece of self-force F2 and um, all of self-force F1. Now, the reason I've changed notation from one and two down to zero and one is that this term here is the adiabatic approximation, zero PA. And this term here is the first post adiabatic approximation, one PA. So I'm using kind of post adiabatic counting in this equation. And now the key idea when it comes to solving the Einstein equation is that we now treat our metric perturbation as a function on an extended manifold. So let's say we had space-time coordinates, time, and three spatial coordinates. So some foliation uh, function t together with spatial coordinates xi. As I said, the time dependence reduces to dependence on mechanical variables. So what does that mean? That means I don't have any explicit t dependence in these perturbations. I'm replacing that t dependence with a dependence on the mechanical variables. 
And so these do you know, change with time. So H1 does change with time, but the point is there's no explicit T dependence. So then when we substitute this into the Einstein equations, we just apply the chain rule. You know, the, 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 a T derivative will act on the dependence on phi and it'll come with a frequency factor because that's d phi dt. And a T derivative will act on the dependence on these j's and you get a dj dt times a derivative uh, with respect to j. And Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah, same question. Yeah. So you are saying uh, from the past equation, the action angle variable, uh, you are still considering this uh, uh, the trajectory as a geodesic, right? At no, 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 no. The past equation actually uh, says like that, right? You have no, uh, no other correction terms in the angle equation. This one here. Yeah. I'm choosing my variables such this is true. So you can show that you can do this to any order. Okay. Okay. You you can alternatively include plus epsilon omega one a plus epsilon squared omega two a. That would be true for a different variable than what I'm writing down here. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so I'm I'm designing my my perturbed action angles in a particular way to make this as simple as possible. I see, I see. There are definitely alternatives um, that you could use and you might want to use in some cases. Okay, so the idea here is we're expanding everything in powers of epsilon at fixed um, xi, fixed phi a, fixed j a. So when you use the chain rule like this, when you have this dj dt, you got to expand that like this. You substitute that into the Einstein equation as well. So what does this do for us in practice? Well, a key assumption here is that the dependence on phi is completely periodic. It's periodic in each of these three phases. So since it's periodic, we can write it as a Fourier series a discrete Fourier series like this, where the coefficients are basically slowly varying amplitudes that are functions of um, these j's and of the spatial coordinates. And we kind of factor out the phase factor. So when you substitute this Fourier series into your Einstein equation, what you get is um, equations for the amplitudes. The phases just factor out and you get equations for the amplitudes. And you can then solve those equations on a grid of J values. Now this isn't moving a million miles away from what we've done historically, because the left-hand side of the field equations, the linearized Einstein operator for these, these amplitudes is identical to what you would have if you had a particle on a geodesic in the frequency domain. So we end up solving familiar frequency domain field equations, but they're no longer equations for the coefficients of you know, e to the minus i omega t. They're now for these coefficients. So the coefficients for the true evolving system, there's no geodesics involved, but the left-hand side looks the same as it did before. So if we have a grid in parameter space like this, with each point being a, a, a set of j values, we are basically solving that same problem I showed you before, that leading order, um, where we had an eternally periodic geodesic orbit. We're not really doing that. We're in fact solving uh, field equations on a torus because these phi's wrap around a torus, but the structure of the problem is the same as what we were familiar with before. So you solve for these um, amplitudes across the whole parameter space, from the amplitudes, you can calculate j dot. And then you've stored j dot and you've stored the amplitudes over the whole parameter space. You then just go back to these equations. So you've got these stored. <coughs> you then just solve these equations to get phi and j as a function of t. And boom, out pops your waveform. So because everything is pre-computed and stored, you've got all your H's stored in advance, you've got your F's stored in advance, um, 
you can generate a waveform effectively instantly this way. So um, tomorrow, Niels Warburton will talk about methods of generating waveforms of this type. This might be a bit different than the way he formulates it, but the tools are already there in this fast Emory waveforms um, toolkit. So basically the hard part of the problem that slows down waveform generation is literally just adding up the amplitudes of the waveform at infinity. That becomes actually the, the slow part because for generic orbit, you have a lot of modes. It's not like you're used to for quasi-circular orbits where you might have you know, L up to five. No, you have, a, you have a lot of modes. And so just adding up all the modes can be slow, but the tools are already there to make this lightning fast and you can generate a waveform immediately. So this is quite different than what we're used to from, from typical LIGO modeling where you build up, you do numerical relativity from first principles, you do post-Newtonian theory from first principles, you then construct um, a phenomenological or an effective model to tie them together. If you're using EOB, EOB itself is still too slow typically to directly use. So then you do another layer of approximation to get a fast waveform. This is a totally different paradigm here where everything's from first principles and we get those waveforms you know, with lightning speed fast enough for data analysis. Okay, so now I wanna go through an example and show you a waveform that we get out. So this is gonna be the complete 1PA uh, approximation, complete 1PA waveform for quasi-circular orbits around a non-spinning black hole. So this is the simplest case. Um, this is the only case we've done so far, you know, at, including all 1PA effects. So for this case, our list of system parameters is very short. We can use the orbital frequency itself as one of our parameters. And then we have the mass and spin of the big black hole. And what we're gonna do is assume that the spin of the big black hole is of order epsilon. So it's, it's small and we can treat it as a perturbation, which means that we're working on a Schwarzschild background the whole time. Then our evolution equations are also quite simple. We just have one phase now. We don't have three phases. We just have particles as a mutual phase, 5p. And we have equations telling us how omega changes with time. And we can write down, or we have written down, um, what these are in terms of the first and second order self force. Then our metric perturbation has a simple form as well. The, the amplitudes depend on these three uh, system parameters. We have a phase factor. And we additionally decompose into spherical harmonic modes so that our amplitudes here only depend on R and Basically, for each value of the frequency, we solve a radial ODE for an LM mode. Now, I've written this here kind of to illustrate the rough idea, but don't take it too literally. Here I'm showing a sequence of circular orbits and basically constructing the in-spiral orbit from that sequence. That's a little bit misleading because that's not quite right. We never approximate the the rate of change of the frequency is zero. We're never using actually a, a circular orbit approximation. We are always using this expansion right here. And wherever this term appears, we leave it there. Wherever this term appears, we leave it there. We don't do any, um, any restriction to circular orbits. But what we do have is equations for a sequence of omega values. And then we evolve through the omega values using these equations. So over the past few years, we've calculated a few different things using this method. Uh, three years ago, we calculated the binding energy. So that is the Bondi mass of the system. So this is the Bondi mass calculated from H1 and H2 at infinity, minus the two rest masses. And we just defined that to be the binding energy. And our data for that, this is 
what's being plotted here is specifically the second order piece of the binding energy. So the piece coming from H2. And the yellow points here are, those are the results we obtained. And basically on the y-axis, we have effectively frequency. And the innermost stable circular orbit is here. So a binary will evolve from the left towards the right. Um, I don't want to get into at all what we're comparing against here. Just ignore that. The point is that we've got um, data for the, the binding energy at a sequence of frequencies like this. So next we calculated the flux, the energy flux, gravitational wave energy flux at infinity. And one thing to realize is that for this, we don't need a complete waveform. You calculate this from the amplitudes. You don't need to know the phases in advance. So we can calculate the amplitudes and calculate the fluxes before we have our complete waveform. So this flux is just, by definition, the negative of the rate of change of the Bondi mass with respect to retarded time at scry plus. One thing to note is that at this point, I'm going to switch from expansions in the mass ratio to expansions in the symmetric mass ratio. You know, so we have um, we have all of our quantities written as functions of the two masses. We can then just express each of the two masses in terms of um, symmetric mass ratio and total mass and then re-expand in powers of the symmetric mass ratio at fixed total mass, rather than um, the ordinary mass ratio at fixed background mass or fixed big black hole mass. So the reason we do that is, one is that it restores what should be an inherent symmetry of the system under interchange of the two masses, um, but also it's known to yield much more accurate results for comparable masses. So when you're not in the extreme of mass ratio regime. So here we're plotting the total flux, the sum of these two things. But I'll stress that there's no resummation involved here. This is just a re-expansion in powers of symmetric mass ratio rather than ordinary mass ratio. So here's the total flux, again, basically as a function of frequency. Um, so the red curve is our data, second order data. The green curve is what you get if you exclude this F1. So if you exclude the second order self force effect and just keep the, the first order effect. Um, this orange curve is 3.5 PN, so the highest order flux that's known, um, or at least it was the highest order when we wrote this paper. And then in blue is exact numerical relativity. And this is for a mass ratio one to 10 or symmetric mass ratio, uh, basically 0.08. And what you see is that, okay, post-Newtonian theory is off by a few percent and it zips off in the wrong direction. Um, Self-force is off by, you know, something significant at small frequencies. This is first order self-force. Um, it's off by a couple percent once you're in the strong field. But once you include second order self-force, there we're actually pretty much bang on over the entire frequency range until close to the innermost stable circular orbit. And this is for mass ratio 1 to 10, so very, very, very far away from the extreme mass ratio regime. And I think Niels tomorrow will show you results for Q equals one for equal masses, which shows that even for equal masses, for some quantities, the self-force approximation is actually very, very accurate. So, I mean, you can see here that we are within, well within the error bars of numerical relativity over this whole range. Okay, so I said that we have the rate of change of the frequency written in terms of the self-forces. Now we still haven't gotten around to actually calculating the self-force, the second order self-force. But we can combine our results for the flux and the binding energy to derive alternative equations for omega dot and get um, the waveform out. <clears throat> 
So by definition of the binding energy, the bonding mass is the binding energy plus the two rest masses. If we then just take a time derivative of this whole, this whole equation, the left-hand side is by definition the minus of the flux. The binding energy we've written or we've calculated as a function of, of frequency and of the mass and spin of the big black hole. So we just apply the chain rule. We get derivative with respect to frequency times omega dot, derivative with respect to black hole mass times m dot, etc. cetera. Uh, the small mass is it's constant to very high order. So we can set that to zero consistently. And then we have uh, the rate of change of the big black hole mass. And then we just rearrange this equation to get an equation for omega dot, which we can then write as an expansion in the symmetric mass ratio, whoops, in the symmetric mass ratio like this. Now, at this stage, we do some more approximations. So I said we have complete 1PA waveforms. That's a little bit misleading. Um, there's some little approximations we do on top. So for example, um, I am just crossing out these two terms. So that's because m dot and j dot numerically are very small. And so while these, in principle, these two terms are 1PA terms, um, numerically they're negligible and we just throw them out. And m dot, this term that's still surviving here, we approximate that as the leading order m dot, like the zero PA m dot, basically because we haven't calculated the, um, the subleading energy flux into the black hole. But again, we expect that to be a very good approximation. So what pops out, ah, and we also do something funny with the binding energy, but I can answer that uh, if people are interested. Now, the point is we've calculated the amplitudes as functions of frequency. Um, we can now calculate this F0 and F1 as functions of frequency. And we then have d phi p dt is omega and the omega dt is this and out pops our waveform. So this is you know, basically exactly how um, post-Newtonian theory and EOB work for, um, for quasi-circular binaries. So this is the waveform for mass ratio one to 10. Blue is exact numerical relativity, a, a particular SXS waveform, but we've compared to many different waveforms. And orange is our 1PA waveform. And you can see it is bang on perfect over a big portion of the inspiral. Um, the inset here is zooming in on the last few orbits. Keep in mind that here I'm plotting the 2-2 mode. So one orbit is actually two cycles, like from here to here. So I'm cutting off the waveform just over one orbit before merger. And you can see we're still pretty accurate even at the end where we cut it off right there. I think there's a like 0 0.02 radians or something in this particular example. So it's very, very accurate. The amplitudes are like, incredibly accurate. And we have, we have to cut this off right now because um, our model breaks down in the approach to the ISCO. So we can't go past the ISCO yet. We are working on that. Okay, so long story short, a 1PA model, um, even for mass ratio one to 10 is very accurate. Um, depending on your accuracy requirements, it might not be accurate enough, but it's impressively accurate for mass ratio one to 10. And we know that our phase error scales linearly with the mass ratio. So we know now that for mass ratio one to 100, we're gonna be incredibly accurate. Mass ratio one to 50, we're probably gonna be more than accurate enough. So 1PA waveforms should cover the whole Emery regime and the whole Emery regime without doing anything else with them, just pure straightforward self-force. Um, but of course, we can then also use um, self-force to do other things. 
like we can inform EOB, we can further calibrate the small mass ratio limit of EOB, basically to help EOB capture uh, mass ratios like 1 to 10, 1 to 100. Um, but it's important to stress again that this is a, a different kind of paradigm where we're not using self-force to inform other faster models. Self-force is already fast. We can generate these waveforms effectively instantly. So what are the next steps? Um, in the near term, if we want to model mass ratios 1 to 20, 1 to 50 for, for LIGO, for example, we really need the merger and ring down. We need those last little bits of the waveform. Those are crucial. Um, we want to add an unaligned spinning secondary. I have, didn't show you the results for aligned spinning secondary, but we already have those. And we're now adding unaligned spinning secondary. We want to put small spin on our primary. So um, I forgot to mention in on the wrong way here. I forgot to mention here that um, at this stage, we are now approximating the spin of the big black hole as zero for the entire duration of the inspiral. So that's another little kludgy thing we do here. But we already have the tools to include that small, you know, order epsilon correction to the spin. And I think Niels tomorrow will show evidence that just a linear correction to the spin is actually pretty accurate. Uh, we can also easily add small eccentricity, like adding linear in eccentricity perturbations. So that will be kind of like a minimal working model for, for you know, mass ratios 1 to 10, 1 to 50 for LIGO. Longer term, um, especially for EMRIs, we really need generic spin on the primary. We need a Kerr background, not a Schwarzschild background because emeries are around supermassive black holes that have very high spin typically. And of course, we also need generic eccentricity and orbital inclination. So there's a long road still to go, but we're now at a stage basically where we have a complete model that's highly accurate um, in a certain regime and it's ready to go. Okay, I will end there. Thank you for listening.